Everybody had a good Christmas? Everybody got exactly what you wanted for Christmas? Yeah, don't answer that question, right? How many of you are just like, Christmas is done, thank goodness? Now I can't see it, you know, and I can't see anybody on my so if that's true. How many of you kind of wish you could go to just one more party? Yeah, no, nobody here. <laughs> All right, well, Christmas is one of those times, I mean, I love Christmas, I love the Christmas music, I love all the things that go along with that, um, but sometimes, you know, the anticipation of it, you know, if you're like my wife, who's totally nuts about Christmas, and she'll, and she's one of those people, which, and I'm giving her all the credit in the world for saying this, I'm saying this as a compliment, she's one of those kind of people that will start next week looking for specials for Christmas for next week. Christmas. I mean, I was proud of myself because I actually got done with my shopping in November instead of, you know, December. But, uh, and there's some of you like that, and I give you all the credit in the world for having that kind of organization and that ability to do it. It ain't happening with this guy. But, you know, yesterday, uh, before uh, Melanie left to go back to uh, Eau Claire, um, you know, we, we got home Friday night, opened gifts, Christmas morning is just kind of a time where we opened stockings and just, uh, we were just sitting there and just enjoying time together and then she had to leave and, and maybe you've felt this before where you've had company and even though nothing else has changed, when somebody leaves, there's a gap, there's a hole there. And uh, I, I said that to Trisha, I said, you know, I just, I love Christmas and I love all of this, it's just so hard coming back off of that, you know, a couple of days now from now. Uh, and we'll be going back to Mankato, and then it's just going to be Trish and I stuck with the dog, which that's not a bad thing either, but when you're used to all the other stuff, it's just kind of a letdown. Um, so this morning we're going to be kind of looking at what happens after the gifts. After the gifts are open, then what? You know, um, if you've ever seen Olaf's Frozen Adventure, anybody seen Olaf's Frozen Adventure? Or you've got to watch it, it's great. I love Olaf. He's, you know, the movie Frozen. Olaf is the snowman, and as far as I'm concerned, he's the star. You know, guy's absolutely nuts. And uh, Olaf's Frozen Adventure is about Olaf uh, trying to go around to find all the different traditions because Elsa and Anna, thank you, Elsa and Anna suddenly realize they've got no Christmas traditions to draw back on. And so it's Olaf's job to go out and find some things that they can do to form Christmas traditions. What kind of Christmas traditions do you have? I'm not going to ask, you know, for actual responses, but what kind of traditions do you have? I know when I was growing up, totally Swedish, home, we'd go to Grandma's house for Christmas, and there'd always be a big bowl of rice. Any Scandinavians know what the bowl of rice is for? Hidden in the bowl of rice was an almond. And so you pass the dish around, and whoever got the only with their rice got a special prize. If you were the last one in the circle of the table, the rice looked like a bomb had gone off in it because my brother was always taking too much to try to find the almond, which was cheating, but he did it anyway. But that was one tradition that we had, you know. Uh, we all have different traditions, and then when they're gone, uh, you just, uh, at least for me, you just kind of feel a, a, a low. Not like I'm going to go into deep depression, don't worry about that. But, but there's that time where it takes back. Um, and having traditions is good. Uh, you know, you can look back on them and, and remember a lot of cool memories from them. Um, but sometimes the past isn't all that good. But we're just going to, I don't know if it was, how much it was by design or what, but Christmas comes obviously at the end of the year. And so a week later we look at the new year. And uh, one of the things that, that uh, I always do Christmas Eve, or New Year's Eve rather, is to watch the ball drop in New York, New York City. I am so thankful for the fact that we live in the Midwest, because I can watch the ball drop, and I can still be in bed before midnight, my time. But we watch it drop, and one of the things that amazes me about watching the ball drop is the people just throwing through Times Square, and you know, all the, you know, we're going to have all this hope, you know, 2022 is going to be a much better year, and blah, blah. it hasn't worked the last few years. Have you noticed that? Things haven't gotten better. And it's not only true in our nation and in our world, but sometimes it's true in our own lives where we look back at the past, and sometimes it's, it's hard to move forward because we think about all the stuff that we've done wrong, and we think about all the things that have gone wrong, uh, you know, 
How was your 2021? Uh, for some of us, had a pretty good 2021. For some of us, we lost loved ones. Uh, for others, we lost jobs or careers or health. Uh, we, so many things that could go wrong. And you think back, is 2022 going to be better? You know, for the world, we don't know that. But how about for us? How can we uh, look, move forward? Billy Graham says something rather interesting. He says this. He, he says, you can't change the past. But with God's help, you can change the future. No matter what your life has been like so far, God wants to put your feet on a new path, a better path, his path, his path. And this morning, as we just spent some time together, that's one of the things that I want us to think about is how we can choose that new path, how we can make sure that we're going in the right direction. Hopefully, I'll give you some ideas from that. I'm going to be reading a short passage for, for you from the book of Philippians, uh, one of my favorite books, which if you've heard me speak here at uh, Zion for a long time, you know that all of the books of the Bible are one of my favorite books. But anyway, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14 says this, and Paul writing to, uh, to the Philippians, and just a little background to that is he's talking about his past, and he's talking about all the struggles that he went through, and all the, the frustrations that he had. And this is what he says. That we've gone through all this stuff about all the things that he's gone through. He says, this, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach to the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. If you bow in prayer just for a bit for me, with me. Lord Jesus, I ask now that as we look into your word, I pray that the uh, words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be pleasing to you and an encouragement to us as we go and get ready to go forth into this uh, new year, as we look back at the past and what we've had, and look forward to what you have for us. I pray that you would just help my words, which would be your words. Uh, to encourage us. Holy Spirit, uh, you are the teacher here. Uh, I am just your mouthpiece, or my desire is to be your mouthpiece. So please teach us and show us what you have for us. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. The first one of those verses, Philippians, I almost forgot about this. The first of those verses says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, but I've already or that I've already achieved perfection. Think about that. Who's writing this verse? The Apostle Paul is writing this verse. If you remember the Bible history, the Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul started his religious career as a Pharisee and a Sadducee in Jerusalem, and his main goal in life was to kill, destroy, Christians and to destroy what was called at that time this the way, this, this new belief system that followed this guy named Jesus of Nazareth. And Paul's main goal in life was to destroy that, to get rid of it. And after a miraculous uh, salvation, a miraculous time on the road to Damascus where Jesus meets him face to face, his life completely changes. His past didn't change. The struggles and the mistakes that he made back then didn't change. What changed was his future. What changed was his outlook. And, and so he's saying to the Philippians, he says, I, have our, I haven't achieved these things. I have not reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. One of the things that I want us to think about as we look at our past is progress, not perfection. Think about what I mean by that. Progress, not perfection. We're heading into a new year. If you haven't seen them already, this time of year, just about every fitness center in the area will be offering special membership deals. Membership deals so that you can join their health club, you can start the new year right, you can get healthy, you can exercise the way you know you should have been, you can eat the way you know you should have, and you can join the health club, and they will make you into a brand new you. And usually, those deals are amazing how cheap they can give you that membership for. Now, before you start praising them for that, let me tell you a little secret behind that. 
Health clubs know beyond a shadow of doubt from history, from what's happened in the past, that three-fourths of the people that buy those memberships in December and January will quit going within a couple of months. And all of a sudden, the money they charge for that becomes profit for them, not a loss. Because they know that we won't stick with it. Sometimes we're like that in the spiritual realm, aren't we? We need to think about it. How many of you, and I won't ask for a raise of hands because I don't want to offend or embarrass anybody. How many of you at some point in life, it doesn't have to be at the beginning of the year, it could be during the year, maybe it could be after one of our services here, have walked out of this place thinking, I need to start praying. I need to start getting into the Bible. I need to clean up my language. I need to clean up my attitude. I need to clean. Uh, you can, you know, you make your own list. I'm not going to make it for you because I got my own list. And you think I'm going to do it. And so you know, walk out of here on a Sunday morning. Monday goes fantastic. Tuesday goes fantastic. Wednesday you slip up. Thursday's a total disaster. And then the weekend gets. And all bets are off. And if you're like a lot of people, me sometimes. You get back to the next Sunday and you either skip church because you feel guilty or you start out the next week and you just say, oh, man, why try? Why try? You know what? God, I'm going to offer up this prayer. I give up. I'm trying to follow you. I love you, Jesus. I believe in all of this. I just can't do what I want to do. I <coughs> Here's the spiritual principle to remember, and that is this. God looks for progress, not perfection. God looks for progress, not perfection. Put a stake in the ground. I'm going to start praying today. I'm going to spend five minutes in prayer every single day. And Monday goes well. Tuesday, you realize you forgot. Wednesday morning gets up. You put a new stake in the ground where you are now. All right, God, here I go. I'm going to do it again. As a parent... We look at our children, if they would do that, we would get frustrated, maybe even angry, and think, why can't you do this? You said you would do this, but God doesn't work that way. You come to him on Wednesday and say, God, I was going to pray every day for five minutes, and I forgot yesterday, I'm sorry, uh, please forgive me, I'm such a loser, I'm such a failure, God says, knock it off, get up, put the stake in the ground, start again. Because I'm not looking for your perfection, first of all, he says, I know you well enough to know, until I bring you home, you will never be perfect. The Apostle Paul wasn't perfect. None of Jesus' disciples were perfect. None of the people in the Old Testament read about Abraham, Moses, Joshua, blah, blah, blah. None of them were perfect. I don't expect you to be perfect. But here's what I ask of you. Make a little progress. Think about where we are. And let's walk through this together. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. I don't need to say I have achieved perfection, but I press on. My progress, you know, like Chuck Swindoll said in the book that he wrote, actually, it says three steps forward, two back. But if I go three steps forward and I go two back, I've still made progress, right? Do the math. i still made progress. So the first thing I want us to think about as we look forward to the new year, as we look back on the last year, is to realize that God doesn't expect us to be perfect. But he does ask for us to show him some progress. Peter, 1 Peter, I think 3, 9, if I remember right, says that he's a God, he's not slow, he's a God of patience. Somebody was talking to me online, talking to me on this last week, he said, why isn't God doing something about all this stuff? Why doesn't he just step in, because God's got the power to do this, step in, destroy evil, destroy all the people that are evil, and let's get on with living the kind of life he wants us to have. And the answer for that is because he doesn't want one person. God does not want one person to go to hell. Not one. And so he's patient, waiting for all of this evil to hopefully work its way through so his church can bring other people to saving faith in Jesus so they don't have to spend eternity. He is patient with us. And I think one of the things Paul is saying here is we need to be patient with us too. Not be perfect.
Just progress. Move closer to him. The second verse says this. Get the book. There we go. So, no, dear brothers, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I think what Paul is saying here is look to the future and not to the failures. Interesting story from the story of, Char of Chariots of Fire. Eric Liddell, of course, the uh, world-famous racer, and, and uh, everybody wanted to beat Eric. And in one of the races leading up to the Olympics, he was almost defeated. The runner that was ahead lost in just the last few feet of the race. He was literally feet away from beating the fastest person in the world. And he could have claimed that for himself, but he came in second. When his coach showed him the tape of the race, it was barely noticeable, but if you looked, as he was approaching the finish line, he looked back to see where Liddell was. And when he looked back, it broke stride just enough for Liddell to, park, to pass it. I think sometimes in our spiritual life, that's what happens. We think we're going well, and then we look back. And I think sometimes Satan does that, by the way. Satan goes, yeah, you're doing pretty good. Don't look back. Don't look back, because as soon as you look back, you're going to see all the failures you've done. One of, the, one of my favorite remembrances of watching you know, Charles Barkley uh, playing basketball. Um, Barkley was playing against the Timberwolves. And it was the year that uh, Kevin Garnett was a rookie. And uh, Barkley had fouled Garnett and sent Garnett to the free throw line. And it was very noticeable. The cameras just happened to catch it. It still makes me chuckle whenever I think about it. It's very noticeable. Barkley comes up, slaps Garnett on the shoulder, and you can, you can read his lips. He says, don't be short. That's all he said. And he walked up to take his place on the free throw line. You can guess what happened with Garnett's first shot, can't you? He was short. Bounced right off the front of the rim. Don't be short. He put that doubt in Garnett's mind and worked famously. And that's what Satan does to us. You don't really think you can conquer this habit, do you? You've been trying to conquer this habit for a long time, and you've never done it. What makes you think you'll do it now? You really think you can start living for Jesus the way he wants? You've never been able to do it. Look how old you are. you failed constantly. You're just a failure. You'll never do it. Paul says, don't look at failure. Look at the future. Look what Jesus can do for you, because... With Paul, he had to learn something. In fact, we learned it when he, he writes in Corinthians where he says, three times I went to God and I asked him to remove this thorn in the flesh from me, and he didn't do it. All he said is, no, oh, Paul, my strength is in your weakness. In your weakest area is where God wants to step in. In the area where you feel the biggest failure, God wants to step in and say, I will make you strong in one area you weak. Don't focus on the failures. Focus on the future. Because it's not about progress. I mean, it's not about, um, what did I say? It's not about perfection. It's about progress. The third thing that Paul writes about is this. He says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I press on to reach the end of the race. Do you notice what Paul is not encouraging us to do? He's not encouraging us to come in first. He's not saying, I press on to be first in the race. He says, I press on to finish the race. I am not a marathon runner. In fact, I tried running one time, and I ran for two minutes straight, and I found out two things. I'm fat, and I can only run for two minutes. That's the only thing I learned from that whole situation. Marathon runners, I give them all the credit. They are amazing. They can run. I had a friend that decided on his 40th birthday, I kid you not, and he did not die doing this, he decided to give himself a present for his 40th birthday. So he ran along Highway 8 
from Taylor's Falls to Turtle Lake and back. Because that's about 40 miles. I'm 40 years old. I'll run 40 miles. The guy is absolutely insane. I could tell you all kinds of stories about Mark Pennell. But that was his, his, his idea of fun. I mean, Mark lived about 10 miles outside of town, and when Mark ran into town to get groceries, he ran into town to get groceries. What I understood from marathon runners and talking to them is there's a point in their, their race, especially when they're training, where they come up against a wall. Maybe you've read about that. And that wall for a marathon runner is that point where every part of their body says, stop. You can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. Let's stop. But a true marathon runner will keep going because they know that they can beat that. It's all about progress. And Paul doesn't say to come in first. He says to finish. He says to finish. If maybe you see like with the Boston Marathon and Minneapolis Marathon sometimes they'll show it. They'll show somebody that is coming in dead last. They are hours literally behind everybody else. Everybody else has got home. But they finished. And I think that's what Paul is saying. Finish the race. It's not about perfection. It's not about your failures. It's about finishing. You know what one of the biggest hindrances to finishing the race is? I think. Maybe I'm just talking about me here, but one of the biggest hindrances to us finishing the race is comparison. Paul says to live according to the prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. If you believe that you are created by God, if you believe that you are created in God's image, if you believe that God has given you certain gifts and abilities, then the natural following to that is to believe that God has a calling for you. Your calling may be to be a pastor. I will help you with that, by the way. Gladly. Your calling may be to be the best mom or dad or parent in the world. God speak to you on that. Your calling may be to be a farmer, be the best you can be. But focus on your calling, not your comparison. I have two friends, I have many friends that are pastors. Two of them that came to my mind when I was thinking about the comparison, because believe me, Believe me when I say this. If you, go, if you could be a fly, a fly on the wall in a pastor's meeting, you would chuckle at the amount of comparison that goes on. I actually had one pastor say to me, about three years into being in the ministry here, say to me, so how big is your congregation? I said, oh, we average about 40, 45 on a Sunday morning. How, many, how, how long have you been there? Well, I think this is my fourth year. I'm quoting him now, because that's how bitter I am. So I'm, like, I'm quoting him. He says, wow, you're not a very good pastor, are you? Bam! Right between the eyes. I've got two friends that I like. Not this guy. Two friends that I like, that I'm tremendously impressed with. One is Pastor Larry. Pastor Larry is a builder both spiritually and physically. And he built, a, he built in a uh, body size sense, a church. And one of the things that he did is he had what he called Mad Saturdays. It was one of the biggest impacts in the community that this church had. And Mad Saturdays stood for Make a Difference Saturdays. And what he would do is he would get a crew of guys together and they would go out, like one time they went, and he found out that this woman, uh, her bathroom was in terrible shape, almost unusable. So he got a group of guys together, and they went out, and they rebuilt her bathroom. The church donated the funds. He got the guys together to go do that. I promise you, brothers and sisters, I will never come to your house to try to rebuild your bathroom. Yes, you may applaud for that, because outhouses still work. I can't build anything. I can't. I just can't. But I also can't compare myself to Larry because that's not my gift. That's his gift. More power to him. 
I had another pastor friend, his name is John, and he pastors a church, and, and one of the things, we went to a pastor's meeting at his church, and he uh, did the devotional and stuff for the meeting. And his entire meeting, or devotional rather, was built around making bread. And he made the bread as he was talking to us. And it was an amazing, I don't remember the lesson, except to remember that it brought the whole idea of bread making and, and God and everything to a level that I never thought of before. And his, a lot of his ministry is built around making breads, um, he also has in the back of the parsonage a, set, a bunch of beehives. He collects beehive, bee uh, honey and, and sells that through the church. And I mean, he's got, he's not, he's not a Larry. He doesn't build building kinds of things, but he's got an ability to do cooking and, and things like that. I, again, will promise you, I'll never invite you to my house to eat a meal I have cooked. Because Macaroni and cheese is about as close as I can go, as long as it's craft. That's not my gift. In fact, I go be honest with you. Some days I don't know what my gift is other than coffee. But each of us has a calling, and I think the biggest thing that we can do individually is not to look at what other people are doing and to say I want to be like them, but to look at Jesus and say I want to be what you want me to be. It's not about call, it's not about comparison. It's not about perfection. It's not about our failures. As we look forward to the new year, I think one of the things that we need to do is just ask ourselves, where are we at in that? Do you focus on wanting to be perfect? Because you're going to wear yourself out. <laughs> Nothing personal, but if you're focusing on being the perfect whatever, you ain't going to make it. I'm not saying you're a failure, I'm just saying you're human. It's not about perfection, it's about progress. And as you look to the future, and this is something, and I've told you guys this before, this is something I still struggle with almost every day. If you're looking to the future, don't look back at how you failed at it before. Perfect example of it. Friday night, you guys were here for Christmas Eve. I wrote that whole thing for Christmas Eve. I'm not bragging when I say that. I'm just saying, I wrote that. I had been wanting to do that for a while, several years. And this year, I finally got up the courage to do it because I was afraid if I did, did it and it failed, I would be a failure. And I finally worked my way through that. There's a few other things I have to work on yet because I still focus on my failures rather than my future. And before you think less of me for that, how often do you do that? How often do we do that? We focus on where we're weak rather than on where we're strong. And the third thing is focus on our calling. And I think one of the things that starting in January, as we is our tradition here in Zion, starting in January, we're going to do a series on prayer. And one of the things I think that is the most important about doing a series on prayer is the fact that it gives us an opportunity to refocus our minds on talking to God about what He wants for us. A lot of times, what I will do starting in January is I'll, I'll journal. You know, just try to remember back the highlights of January, February, March. What were the good things that happened? What, what were things that didn't happen? What were things that happened that weren't really good? Where could have I improved? Where should I have done differently? How did I do here or there? And I think that's important for us, not to think about our failures, but to, to give God opportunity to say, all right, now we're going to move forward. So some questions for you as we close. Thinking back to 2021, I don't believe we're already looking at 2022. I remember when I was at school thinking 2000 was like a million years ago, and now it's 22 years ago? Crazy. But in 2021, what was your wall? Was it the pandemic? Was it fear? Was it finances? Was it relational? Was it spiritual? What was your wall in 2021? Take just a couple of minutes, full of you to watch them online as well. Just take a couple of minutes to think about that. What was your wall? 
What was the one point in 2021 where you just didn't want to go on? What are areas that stalled you? <laughs> what are some areas you're glad to leave behind? Second question is this. What did you learn? Notice the question. Notice the question that's not up there. The question that's not up there is, how did you fail? I didn't ask that. Because as I told a group of kids that I was coaching in basketball one time, as eighth grade basketball coach, and the first practice of the season we sat down and gave the team rules and stuff. And I said, one thing I want you guys to remember is that we have never lost a game while I've been coaching. And they all knew that was a lie in the sense that they looked at me because they all knew that we'd lost games the previous year. Before they could call me on I said this. Here's the reason I'm saying that. I said, if you lose a game score-wise, but you learn something from it, then you haven't lost. You simply learned to do better. So you already got your wall up there, some area that you realize you didn't do well with in 2021. What did you learn from that? I have a friend that uh, he and his wife are currently separated. And uh, they're one of those couples that you looked at and just thought they were, you know, the 2021 version of Adam and Eve. I mean, they had it made. They were perfect. And I found out, guess what? <laughs> they weren't perfect, just like none of us are. But one of the things that he told me in our times together as we would talk through this whole thing is about how they had gone to counseling, and I think they may be back together now, or very close to it. But he said going through counseling brought up all of this stuff from his upbringing. He never, he, that's interesting too, he never talked about the things that she had to learn. Which is probably why they're getting back together. He didn't focus on her, he focused on him. But he started talking about all the things from his past that he never even thought about that were being drug up that he had to deal with. I didn't realize this about him, but he said I would, I would get frustrated with something about work and I would lash out at her, which he told me that and was kind of like, not you, but he would. But then he said, but you know what I started to learn? Is that's how my dad was. I was always so afraid of failure because dad would yell at me if this happened. He said, I need to relearn the fact that when things are going bad in this section of life, I don't take it out on my wife or anybody else. I deal with it here. That was what he learned. I'm not going to tell you all the things I've learned from 2021. But what about you? What are some things that you learned from that walk? Think of the challenges. Because, and I think Paul alludes to this in the passage that we studied today, everything in your past has prepared you for something in the future. Think about it. Everything in your past has prepared you for something in the future. Whatever it was, however bad it was, you're going to be able to use that, or God's going to be able to use it, I should say, for that. Third question for you tonight, this morning. What's your God-given dream? Dream a little. And when I say dream a little, notice I put God-given dream. Don't just fly off the handle and think, this is what I'm going to do. Be willing to pray a dangerous prayer. A very dangerous prayer. And here's the dangerous prayer. You can word it however you want. God, what's the biggest thing you want me to accomplish in 2022 through your power? Want to write a book? Maybe you should. <laughs> you want to start a new business? Maybe you should. You want to stop one business and just... Take something on an easier road, maybe you should. You want to do better in this area or that area of your life? Man, we've had the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of all creation living within us. Yeah, they can be able to help us accomplish it. I think so. So as we close, get ready to uh, close up this morning. Tracy, by the way, you can come on up. What was your wall in 2021? What did you learn from it? And what's your God given dream? Let's stand together as we close.
And we're going to spend just a very, very few minutes as you're standing with your head bowed, asking God those three questions. And then spending some time in prayer asking Him about that. So I'm going to say a question. I want you to just spend a few, maybe seconds, asking God for the answer. Ready? What was your wall? Let's pray. Father God, I pray against our walls. Walls are not meant to hinder us as believers. Walls are meant to help us climb. Help us to be wall climbers. The second question is, what did you learn? Jesus, there's not a day that doesn't go by that I learned something. Sometimes they aren't real pleasant lessons to learn. I'm guessing that my brothers and sisters that are here are watching online or will be watching online at the same thing. I ask that you just help us to learn the lessons that you want us to learn. And the third question. <coughs> what you got in a dream? What dangerous prayer are you willing to pray this morning that God will do something huge in your life? Let's pray. Father God, everlasting Father, mighty God, Prince of Peace, wonderful Counselor, I thank you for who you are in our lives today. And I just believe that there's a lot of people that may be listening right now even that are like me. Where there have been certain things that they've wanted to accomplish, certain things that they've wanted to try and they've just been too scared. Forgive us for our lack of faith. Empower us with your Holy Spirit to dream big. And not only to dream big, but then to ask you to help us to accomplish those dreams. And in that, we will experience the joy that you have for us. And I pray this in your name.